So good morning to everybody in Hawaii. Good good evening to everybody in Norway. Um, glad we could have everybody here. And welcome to the June 2021 version of Renew Rebuild Hawaii. And uh, thanks, Michael Markrich, for setting this up and Ida for helping put it all together. Um, guys, I'm Stan Osterman um, from Stan the Energy Man and other places little known. And uh, we have a great program today. And uh, the idea behind the program was to get um, some insight from Norway, which may seem like a strange place for Hawaii to get insight from. But when it comes to hydrogen, uh, Norway is actually been on the cutting edge of hydrogen for, I would say, at least a half a century. Um, one of the biggest electrolyzer companies in the world is um, works out or was established in Norway, Nell Hydrogen. And they even bought out plug, uh, Proton on site, which is one of our big uh, electrolyzer companies here in the US. Um, so they've been into hydrogen for a long time. And um, it, it's good for us to get insight from other places, especially as um, Paul and Mitch will tell you and Dave Rolf is that uh, we're kind of frustrated that hydrogen isn't making a bigger splash in Hawaii, um, especially as we move towards the 100% renewable by 2045. Because when it comes to energy storage, batteries come with a, a lot of baggage and cost where hydrogen uh, eliminates a, a lot of those things and is much cleaner and safer. So we, we wanted to talk to a couple of folks from Norway. We've got two great guests from Norway and Eugene um, Tan from DBED to give us some insight, uh, number one in Hawaii on the economics or the economic viewpoint of, uh, of our energy situation as we start moving towards more renewables. And then um, Ulf Hasfeld from, uh, he's, he's got his own company, it's uh, uh, Hainan. And he actually has a couple of hydrogen stations and put them up in Norway. And also Andres uh, Olgaard, who is the um, senior project manager for an organization called Centaf. And, um, they're going to be doing the presentations today. And then our panel members are Mitchu and Paul Pontio uh, and Ida um, to help us generate some questions. If you folks have questions and you can put them in chat, I'll be monitoring chat and we'll, we'll try and get as, as many questions in as we can. So we're going to start off with uh, Eugene um, with his presentation. And he's going to give us a, a kind of a snapshot of Hawaii's economy, which of course is in a kind of a struggling state right now um, with the tourism just coming back. But um, we're, we're trying to get a, a picture of Hawaii's economy from a, a, an energy perspective. Because um, I think a lot of us don't really appreciate um, how much energy it takes to run any economy and the economic impact. So Eugene, um, when you're ready, we'll uh, let you roll in. Okay, let me start my slide. Uh, let me know if you don't see it. Nope, they're up. I'll do a slide show. Today, uh, Mike asked me to talk about uh, the petroleum use in Hawaii, mainly. So I will start with uh, the total primary energy, uh, how much we use for petroleum. The energy, there are two definitions. One is called total energy and the total primary energy. The difference between these two is just the electricity. Electricity is the secondary because they generated by primary. So basically it's generated by the, um, mainly is by the uh, petroleum. So then we add the uh, electricity and it will become the total energy. So you can see from this slide uh, that uh, our energy consumption is uh, the latest data from EIA is 2018. So it's about 84.4% petroleum. And I will tell you uh, what uh, is by sector. So that this slide shows the uh, number of million barrels of uh, petroleum product we uh, consumed. So the uh, increase is actually, uh, you can see the uh, jet fuel. So this is, many of these are in the uh, 
transportation sector. So if you look at the last column, which is the total, uh, we consumed 2018 about 44.6 million barrels. So this um, billion, uh, this is in, I think this is in thousand, uh, I think I have the I mean, administrative this to be in thousand barrels. So 44.6 million barrels. And then um, NASA decreased from 1990. Uh, it's mainly because of the electricity generation uh, is changed to uh, uh, a large part uh, changed to the renewables. So in terms of the petroleum consumption by sector, uh, you can see the transportation is still the largest sector is 65.3% uh, of all the petroleum consumption is by the transportation sector. The transportation sector, including all the vehicles, including the cars we drive, and you can see the electrical sector is a decrease. Uh, this is for electricity generation. Uh, in the last uh, 28 years, it decreased from 31.3% to 23.7%. So the uh, residential, commercial, and the industrial, they pretty much similar, uh, but the main change is actually in the electricity generation and the transportation. So in terms of uh, electricity generation, uh, you can see uh, I have 1990 and 2018 comparison. Uh, this is in terms of buildings of BDUs. So you can see the main use for electricity generation. These uh, are these two uh, major types of uh, fuel oil, uh, residual oil is actually the majority, and uh, desiccated uh, fuel oil is the second. That's only two types of oils. They are the byproduct of the uh, refinery. They are used for generating uh, electricity. The total use in 1990 is 97.6. Uh, so this is embedded bid use. So it's decreased by about 33 percent. Then the Electric, the energy uh, efficiency, and also the uh, renewable sources is also increased uh, because of the uh, decrease in the uh, use of petroleum is because of two things. One is the increase in efficiency, and the second is the uh, increase in renewable sources. The electricity generation is actually uh, increased by about 1.1%, but you see the uh, fuel use, uh, petroleum use is actually a decrease. Then coming to the uh, petroleum consumption by sector. So we divided the economy into five sectors, transportation, electricity, industry, and the commercial residential. So you can see transportation, the uh, majority, the transportation industry use all five types of the uh, petroleum. So the majority is in the uh, jet fuel and motor, uh, motor gasoline. So it's still the same case as in 1990. Uh, it's more, a little bit more increase in the jet fuel because of tourism. And the motor gasoline also increase is also part is due to uh, tourism because visitor, uh, visitors, they also use the rental cars. Uh, electricity sector, they use only two types of uh, fuel, petroleum. Uh, majority is the residual. Uh, there was some change between uh, these two years. Uh, there will be a little increase in desiccated fuel oil and uh, some decrease in the residual fuel. Uh, industry use is also a, uh, some change between the residual fuel and uh, this other petroleum. Other petroleum is mainly is the uh, uh, propane and the gas. So commercial sector, especially in the residential, is mainly uh, is for uh, is propane uh, gas. So in terms of the expenditure, in terms of dollars, uh, how much do we spend on petroleum? Is about four point seven billion dollars. This $4.7 billion, you can see, is about three and a half billion is in the transportation. So we are talking about the um, less than 
$1 billion for electricity. Even when we have 100% by 2045 for electricity generation, and we still have the majority of the work will be in the transportation. So this is about 75% of the petroleum use is in the transportation. I think we need to reduce the, uh, is, is, is a big job to reduce the petroleum use in the transportation sector. So electricity sector is the one with current energy standard um, by 2045 is 100%. So in terms of uh, petroleum consumption, you can see the largest is actually is motor gasoline it is uh, 36%, 1.7 billion. The next is the jet fuel. Uh, the one used by the airplanes is about 29%. So these uh, 4.7 billion petroleum, I think 3.7 is roughly about $3.7 billion are imported. Uh, we spend $3.7 billion uh, importing the petroleum. The Hawaii refineries add up about $1 billion. So uh, because they uh, refine the product and the result in the state. So that what you added uh, by the refineries is about a billion. So that's uh, total is 4.7 billion. In terms of uh, energy, this is uh, in terms of uh, expenditures, uh, you can see this uh, primary spending is about 4.7 billion. And uh, that's in, in the previous slide. The total energy is about 6.6 .6 billion. So this, the difference here, I think is about 1.7 billion. That 1.7 billion, is the electricity addition. So the electricity, uh, when we add electricity, it will uh, become total energy from primary. So we add up um, the total net uh, add up for the electricity is about 1.7 billion. Uh, but the Hawaii, uh, the ut utilities, the total sales is about, uh, is around 3 billion. So um, I think, but because they use uh, petroleum to generate electricity. So um, we, those uh, petroleum generating electricity is included in the primary. So we only adding the uh, net increase in the electricity consumption that we are adding about 1.7 billion. So you can see the petroleum consumption. This is 4.7 billion. And uh, among this is about 3.7 billion are imported and the total, if you look at the total primary percentage, it didn't change much in the last 30, 40 years. But in terms of total energy, it's decreased from 86%, 87% in 1980 to about 71%. And this is my last slide. It shows that uh, the uh, energy efficiency, uh, this is measured by the dollars of real GDP per million uh, BTU, as you can see is a increasing. Uh, so for uh, each unit of BTU used to generate the real GDP, it has been increasing over the years. And as the data we have uh, in 2018, so uh, it's increased to about $280.7 per million uh, BTU. I will uh, stay for any questions you may have. And that's conclude my uh, presentation. Okay, Eugene, thanks. And again, if uh, you have questions and you want to send them in on chat, um, if you're, I don't know if Eugene will be able to stick around all the way till the end of our um, forum. But one thing I wanted to point out from Eugene's briefing, he had a lot of great information in there is the solution to, the, to at least the uh, ground transportation part is going to be electric vehicles. And that's going to drive Hawaiian Electric almost, I would say, more than double their production right now and distribution. And everybody, I, I think, misses that point that if Hawaiian Electric is going to have to grow that much to take care of electric vehicles, um, it's, it's an unbelievable hurdle. And that's where hydrogen comes in. I think we have to share that electric vehicle uh, market with hydrogen to make sure we can meet those goals by, by 2045 and reduce our, our carbon footprint. 
Um, next up, um, we have uh, Anders. Um, if you're ready, we can switch it over to you, and you can run your uh, you can run your presentation. Um, Anders is uh, he's he's a youngster looking, but he's actually pretty darn experienced. But he looks like a kid. He's not not old and crusty looking like me and Michael. Um, but uh, he's got a he's got a lot uh, a lot going on in Norway, and uh, we asked him to give a quick presentation on. The kind of things he's involved in. So I'm turning it over to you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Thank for the nice introduction. <laughs> you see my presentation now in the presentation mode? Pretty good. Okay, so um, yeah, as, as Stan mentioned, I'm a uh, senior project manager here at Sintef. I've been here for um, 15 years, been involved in fuel cells for more than uh, 20 years, and um, can uh, say a bit more about what we do here at Sintef. So uh, you'll have to bear with me on a couple of uh, uh, commercial slides in the beginning, but I think it will be interesting anyhow. So um, then again, thanks for, uh, for inviting me. Um, looking forward to to the two hours here in the evening. Uh, have the sunshine here like you probably have as well. Um, okay, so uh, Sintef is a um, independent nonprofit research organization. So I don't know how that is in, in the US, but um, in Europe, there are quite, uh, quite a few of these and uh, there's a variety of how much funding you get from uh, from state. I know uh, in the US you have different uh, research uh, central organizations like one we work with is NREL and you have uh, Los Alamos um, as well. So um, Zintef is, is probably somewhat comparable to that but we don't have any, we have 8% um, base funding and the rest is sort of run through uh, contracts either with them um, uh, direct from industry or it's these uh, these funding programs so uh, uh, even though we say we're one of Europe's largest there are 2,000 people uh, working on uh, all kinds of, of fields in, in uh, technology and, and, and science sort of from from ocean uh, to to space and uh, materials to to medicals and yeah a uh, whole bunch of different stuff. Um, today's uh, interest is uh, from, from my side I'm going to talk about is of course uh, hydrogen and also fuel cells. So in this area we are active in the whole value chain uh, both on hydrogen and fuel cells like lasers. So I'm not sure if you can you see my pointer here? Okay you can see that as well. So uh, here up to the left you have uh, uh, pictures showing materials uh, where we develop, for instance, uh, catalysts and um, uh, support. Uh, we can also work on material components uh, or, sorry, um, coatings for components. So what you see here is a uh, cut through or a bipolar plate, a metal uh, stamped one. And on these uh, surfaces, you need to coat the steel. So uh, here we also work with um, the automotive industry, uh, have tested materials for, for these in our labs. We work on uh, modules and control systems. These are sketches from batteries. So uh, we, in our same department, we work on both fuel cells and batteries, of course, because they're very similar technologies and um, fundamental um, electrochemistry. Um, we have activities on, on uh, system design, optimizing hybridization. Um, you have batteries for the faster peaks and uh, you can have the fuel cells for the longer duration operation. Um, different labs uh, for our activities, testing uh, electrolyzers, fuel cells, different scales. We do um, demonstration pilots. We have lots of European projects. So uh, in Norway, we have some national programs and then there's some common European programs. So we also can apply for funds cooperating with European partners. And one, for instance, I'll come back to this, is the Refine project. Um, which is a 10 megawatt electrolyzer. 
uh, together with uh, Shell and ITM uh, in the UK. So um, then outside the technical scope, of course, look into circular economy, uh, recycling aspects, um, LCA analysis, mm -hmm. um, e e economic analysis to um, optimize business cases. Uh, then the third and final uh, commercial slide is an example on the electrolyzer topic, which we've been working on a long time. So uh, as you also said earlier today, Norway has a long tradition in electrolysis, which comes from uh, early 1900s, where uh, we used um, electrolyzers to produce hydrogen for ammonia. And, and fertilizer production. So uh, I think we still have the world record in the uh, sizes. So 100 megawatts and larger electrolyzers were in operation in Norway. They're not that any longer, but uh, it all comes from this Nell technology. <clears throat> so um, then again, sort of early 2000, activities started increasing again on, on uh, hydrogen and electrolyzers here in Norway as well. And we uh, established a European project on uh, PEM electrolyzers, um, uh, more fundamental research and development. And through those years, uh, from 2010 to 2021 now, we, we've been working on different projects in the same series and the same funding program. And we're now coordinating this 10 megawatt PEM electrolyzer uh, project um, together with Shell and ITM. Uh, and now in, uh, in one month, we're opening uh, the site, uh, production will start and um, there's a, a video streaming of this event um, from, um, from the Cologne uh, refinery of, of Shell. I can, uh, there is, uh, <clears throat> it's possible to um, to register for this event, and uh, I can see if I can find a link and send it to, to Stan, and perhaps you can spread it around. I don't know. Um, we'll see about that. Okay, so then uh, I'll go to and talk a bit more about the Norwegian activities here. And what was interesting was to uh, compare with the previous uh, presentation looking into energy uh, use in. Um, uh, for uh, for Hawaii and and uh, I, uh, I I don't know the direct conversion from uh, BTUs to kilowatt hours, so uh, I might have mistaken a bit here. My my calculations was that uh, two hundred fifty thousand BBTUs would convert to seventy two terawatt hours, but I, I found that a bit strange that um, you'd use less energy than we use here in Norway. So my calculations are perhaps wrong, I don't know. Um, anyway, what, what you see here is that the energy use in Norway um, per year is about 200 terawatt hours. And it's divided, uh, not exactly, but not far from a third in transportation, uh, one use of electricity, and then you have some other uses can be other, um, other fuels or uh, resources into industrial or manufacturing part. So we have uh, uh, we have lots of uh, renewable electricity. So hydropower covers almost all electricity consumption in uh, in Norway. Um, but what you see here to the left is what we what we produce or uh, take out of the ground or ocean on, on oil and gas. So we are a, have a long tradition in, in fossil fuels. So we, as you see here to the, to the right, we produce 2% of the global oil and uh, we supply to Europe uh, more than 25% of Europe's uh, natural gas consumption. So we uh, actually produce or, uh, or take out 10 times more energy than we use in Norway. Um, I guess 
for this hydropower part, we uh, we can still be be proud. For this fossil part, uh, this is a bit more under discussion at the moment, of course. So um, I'm, I'm not going to go into that right now. But you see, it's a very different uh, picture here to many other countries that uh, we have almost surplus of all kinds of energies. We have one coal uh, mine and a coal power plant up uh, at the island Svalbard. Uh, that's a very small one and it's sort of tradition uh, has some historic reasons why there is coal activities there still, but that will be shut down uh, pretty uh, soon. And uh, we'll try to look into some renewable options, of course. Uh, so uh, then uh, what many of us are looking into and uh, now happily see more support into this area is to what shall Norway do after the uh, fossil age. So when we uh, want to stop taking out <clears throat> oil and gas, where do we, uh, where do we go then? And um, <clears throat> of course, there is still uh, quite some potential in um, our natural gas, which will still be available. Um, but this means then, of course, to take care of the CO2 in one or the other way. And there's already quite some activities on, uh, on CCS, so uh, carbon capture and storage. So now there's, <clears throat> there's a multi, multi billion kroner um, uh, project established to drill the first uh, CO2 um, um, yeah, let's see. Storages under the seabed in uh, in outside of, of Norway. So that's uh, I don't really know the time frame of this, but it, it's it's going really fast now. So this is under establishment now, and uh, yeah, uh, quite a huge project. Not focused on hydrogen really. It's more for taking care of CO two from different other in, in, in industry. Uh, processes, but um, this is something which can and is look been looked look, 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 look into if it's relevant for hydrogen production as well from natural gas. So um, activities now are into looking at hydrogen from renewables and from natural gas, so we can supply both blue and green hydrogen, or we can convert it to ammonia, so blue and green ammonia. So there's I'll come I have another map afterwards here where you can see the different um, uh, sites in, uh, in uh, Norway and what's going on there in this field. Um, <clears throat> also a, a map and it's a, yeah, lots of information here, but we don't need to go through all in detail. But you see uh, here up in uh, the northern part, um, it's not actually built, but there is quite some activity from a company called Technip FMC to establish offshore wind and hydrogen production. Um, at the time being, there is a 2.5 megawatt electrolyzer being installed. Uh, will also be operating already in July, um, directly connected to a wind farm, but onshore, not offshore. Um, this is Trondheim, where I'm situated, middle of Norway. Here we also have quite some, some projects. We have four of these Scania hydrogen trucks running around here. Uh, Osco is a, uh, is a grocery retailer. And uh, we've had uh, this nice project with them to establish the, their fueling station, production hydrogen on site, and these uh, hydrogen trucks. Um, <clears throat> Norway is a marine nation, so uh, there's lots of focus on, on both operating ships, but also building. So our industry, uh, which have suffered quite a bit the last decades, I think, in the maritime, because it's high competition, but now uh, looking into being uh, in the front when it comes to hydrogen and batteries. So batteries, we are really doing good with lots of ferries and technology competence. Um, and also suppliers. Now we do the same for hydrogen. So these are just the examples on, um, <clears throat> on hydrogen or ammonia ships, which are being built or will be built soon. So this um, ferry 
at the very bottom here is the first one in the world which we realized with liquid hydrogen storage. Um, and that will also be in operation this year. Um, this one is an ocean, ocean service vessel for the, uh, for the uh, oil and gas industry, which will be fueled by ammonia. Um, and this uh, white ship here is more of a cargo vessel going between sites uh, along the coastline of Norway. So there's, there's lots of activity and uh, we're, uh, much of this is linked to uh, renewable energies and the marine industry, seafood uh, industry. Oh no, sorry. Uh, then the second last slide is on uh, funding or how is this being financed? Much of the activities, so as I said, we do lots in the European uh, framework as well. So I divided in two. You have uh, one section here, which is <clears throat> looking into the different um, uh, R&D or industrial levels. So uh, this NFR, two top lines here, it's the Research Council of Norway, and they are funding more in uh, sorry uh, research or, or organizations and universities linked up to support industry um, innovation Norway that's uh, more linked to industrial development they fund industry directly uh, but can also be a cooperation with uh, researchers and then the NOVA is more of a pilot demonstration and would then fund sort of the end user in this. It's a, it's, a, it's a quite a good um, framework for, uh, for funding. And, uh, but then again, sometimes we can disagree upon their priorities, but that's, um, that's another political question. So um, pilot E, I think that's been developed um, after, the, um, after a uh, program in the US, DARPA, is that some kind of program? It might have been some military development program, I don't know, but it's a combination of uh, these um, funding agencies. So they fund the whole value chain from um, uh, fundamental R&D up to demonstration and pilot. Uh, then I mentioned also the European side. So there's different um, programs. Uh, you have pure uh, R&D, and then you also have these direct industrial and, and uh, uh, support for large-scale um, demonstrations. So this IPSE is very popular now, so it's important project of common European interest, I think, and they are sort of able to fund very large projects and with very large percentage, so it can realize this type of projects. Um, Okay, skip to the last slide, uh, which yeah, meant to cover a bit on uh, regulations and, and policies. It's not my, uh, my field of expertise, but I have some informa in information here on it. So in Norway, we have uh, authorities which are um, uh, divided in different areas. So what we have is here, um, yeah, I'm not sure what it's called in English actually, but this is the um, authorities for offshore uh, oil and gas activities. And they, <clears throat> of course, we're now looking into offshore wind with hydrogen and also if you want to produce hydrogen on platforms from natural gas. So they will be covering that area and we have talked to them as well and they're not very much concerned of uh, hydrogen when it comes to regulations and, and rules or procedures because their procedures would cover any kind of material or, or use. So it's, it's, um, it, it's not specific to, to uh, any cases. Um, the NMA, that's the uh, Maritime Authorities and uh, I guess that's known from many at least that the regulations on sea are very strict and they're very detailed, but they also, and that's not in place for hydrogen, but when it comes to boats, they anyway have this 
um, this, it, it's, it's not a shortcut, but it, it's at least a way to overcome the lack of regulations. So there's a process they call alternative design procedure, which is a sort of design procedure you have to follow to get approval. So you just have to make sure that your design is just as safe as a, um, a, a, a conventional ship. Uh, DSP is the authority for land, and uh, they are a bit more difficult, or not that they want to be, but the system is more difficult. So they have to go through these thorough hazard has up um, processes. I mentioned here Sjövo, perhaps Ulf will can come into that. I'm not sure if you want to discuss this um, accident in at the uh, fueling station in Norway, but uh, you mentioned that when we talked earlier. Um, maybe before this meeting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into all of these details. Perhaps we'll discuss a bit later as well. Uh, knowledge sharing is very important. We see that across states or nations, you know, in Europe, that's very good. Uh, there's a need to speed up the processes. The same is happening on the policy side because you have to make sure where the hydrogen is from. Is it really green or is it uh, at least clean? Um, so some kind of certificate uh, to be um, combined with policies is very important to, to get in place. And we had there's some European efforts into this uh, to have some some kind of standards or also some certificates. Yeah. It's not it's not just it's not uh, complete. And then there's also some other European um, uh, activities which are relevant so renewable energy directive from the commission in Europe and um, uh, much of this will be presented now during the summer uh, also together with the correct taxonomy so how do you how do you place taxes on the correct ways for uh, for introducing not only hydrogen but of course the whole renewable energy landscape will be new now and have to replace all those uh, fossil fuels okay so that was it. Sorry, taking taking a bit long time, but uh, yeah. Had Thanks, moment. Anders. And um, I did have one question on chat that doesn't directly relate to hydrogen, so we probably should handle it now. I, one one of the individuals wanted to know if uh, Norway has a system or a way of recycling lithium ion battery, so that um, the electric vehicles and such can uh, be safely handled at end of life. Uh, uh, I know there's, uh, it's being established by uh, some rather large, at least from for Norwegian uh, relations. I don't remember who perhaps Ulf uh, knows more than me, but there's, it's being established a uh, recycling uh, facility in, in Norway with uh, great capacity and we have lots of battery production now also coming up. So um that's a it's a very yeah it's being established a good value chain there okay great well thanks um anderson we really appreciate that we'll have some more questions coming from the panel a little bit later um next up presentation will be by uh oh Hafseld of uh hanyan i don't know if i'm pronouncing hanyan right but um he's uh Again, an extremely experienced individual in the hydrogen world in Norway and um, comes more from the business side than the research uh, and, and uh, development side. And he's going to give us some insight into what his company does and how hydrogen's being promoted and implemented in Norway. So, oh, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Stan. It's, uh privilege to be invited here, although I would like to be there in person, but that maybe another time we can come over. Um, I think I'll start to show you a film that we made uh, when we introduced at the Norwegian Stock Exchange uh, two months ago. Uh, it's a short film, about two minutes. Uh, so I'll see if we can get it up on the screen right now. Let me see. There we well, we know it worked before, so we'll, we'll let you get going on that. Yeah, yeah. Here we so go. We make it work again. So there we are. Is it now running? 
and with some young company, but we have Can long experience. We have uh, been working with hydrogen fuel for almost two decades. We believe that your next growth is a very important step for us to achieve our ambitions and to move forward on our plans. Kino's ambition is to become one of the major hydrogen fueling operators in Europe. In order for hydrogen to become a solution for many people, we need more stations. We will move up to about 30 stations in the next few years in and around the major cities in Scandinavia. Hydrogen, you can compare to uh, fossil fuel cars with a fueling just as fast and almost the same driving range. But with hydrogen, you will get a silent car because it's electric and it also emits just pure water. We will be as green as possible. We will use either electrolysis, consuming only water and renewable energy. We also use renewable energy at our site at Høvik. Now it's quite interesting to see that the fossil fuel cars will have to be replaced by zero emission alternatives. And there I think that hydrogen can be a replacement one-to-one. -one. Get silent driving, a zero emission, and you will contribute to a greener globe. Hydrogen is a safe alternative to other fuels. We just have to know how the characteristics and know how to handle them. If you do it the right way, like we have done in hydrogen for 20 years, it's a safe fuel. Very well, so this was the um, short introduction. Um, let me stop this and um, move over to my presentation. Yeah, I'm really glad that your uh, video uh, highlighted the safety aspects of hydrogen, uh, Ulf, because that's always a big question for all of us when we're trying to introduce a topic to people is safety. So um, we appreciate you addressing that. Well, we have been working safely with hydrogen for 20 years, so that should be okay. Uh, okay, with the presentation right now, then I'll move on. Um, we say that we are uh, Scandinavia's most experienced hydrogen fuel retailer because we have been doing this for almost 20 years. Um, we are a young company, Hedion, just two and a half years old. But the people inside, we have been working with hydrogen fuel for almost 20 years. First in Norsk Hydro as one of the big industrial companies in Norway, where you mentioned Nell, the electrolyzer company. We used to be in the same department, uh, the business development and the electrolyzer department. But uh, the funny part of working in Norsk Hydro was that they really wanted to do something and they were acting, taking part of uh, most important European projects going on at that time, like the clean urban transport, testing out buses in Europe. Uh, so we actually built hydrogen stations with electrolyzer production in, um, in Iceland and in Germany. Uh, we also took part of a project in, uh, in Berlin, Clean Energy Partnership, with an electrolyzer there. Um, and then we initiated, uh, started up uh, the Hydrogen Road of Norway and the Scandinavian Hydrogen Highway Partnership. Uh, and until 2007, we built our first station in Norway, uh, in Porsgrunn. It's still there, and I'll show it uh, later. Then we were merged into Statoil, and uh, we built two more stations at petrol stations, uh, integrated at the site, at the forecourt, plus another one in Berlin. But then Statoil decided that they will withdraw from all downstream business. And my last job in Statoil is actually to sell out everything we have built up for many, many years, even biofuels and uh, all other activities. And we then created a separate uh, standalone company called HiOp that took, took over the three stations from Statoil and later acquired two more stations. So it had a five station network. Uh, we also took part of several European projects and uh, looked at the new bus fuel, where we designed the base for a hundred buses and uh, look into the options you had to have for running such a show and found out that you can actually do it at the same cost as diesel. Uh, unfortunately, it was a tough job to walk through the Valley of Death for six years, so we had to call it a day and had to start up again as uh, Hynion in um, early 2019. And then we got also some Swedish investors, so we got more interest uh, in Sweden. Uh, acquired two of the uh, HIOP stations and then later on uh, a station in Gothenburg in Sweden. 
Only two months ago, I mentioned we were listed at uh, the Oslo Stock Exchange, and that g give us some money for uh, realizing our plans. So where do we want to go? Uh, we have Hervik, that's um, the, the busiest uh, hydrogen station in Northern Europe. I think only the one in Paris, Paris at uh, the Oly airport, where they have all the taxis is uh, this year. We have approximately 20 cars per day coming into our station. And it's uh, quite uh, quite busy. Um, we have built this Hervik station as a redundant station. That means it's two lines. So it means if one line is down because of some fault, you can still fill on the other line. And that gives a, a very good reliability and uh, confidence. You build confidence in people now. Uh, because of what Anders mentioned, we had this incident at uh, the competitor station uh, two years ago. And we have to rebuild confidence uh, in people that we have. Uh, we can refuel cars, we can do it safely, and we can do it whenever they want. Uh, so since we opened in um, autumn 2019, we had more than 6,000 refuelings, and it's all going very well. Uh, we are now renovating our station in Porsche, that's at the industrial area, uh, a little bit south in uh, Norway. Uh, there we have a pipeline supply from the industry with a, a co-product uh, from uh, chlor alkaline production, also with electrolysis and green electricity. We had some inventions there, like the world first underground storage for hydrogen. And it's uh, has been a very busy station for many, many years. We think that we will uh, open it by end of this month for business again. The Gothenburg station is also under renovation uh, and will open uh, later this year. We are refueling some uh, trucks, uh, renovation trucks, as a trial project. And it will be uh, all on the um, automatic uh, filling in just a few weeks' time. We also plan to install a reformer uh, using biogas to reform that into hydrogen. So further, we want to move on and um, say that in the, in the next few years, we will have uh, eight stations in the, by end of 2022, and then up to 30 stations uh, in the next few years, and moving up to large scale expansion uh, in Europe uh, in the years to come. So uh, policies and market development is quite interesting because um, the fuel market is about to change dramatically. There's no doubt about that. If you look into the UN Sustainable Goals, uh, down to European Green Deal, and all the regions, what they have targets, and also local communities, it's all moving towards different uh, fuels, and they have to be low carbon emission and hopefully also zero emission. If you see down to the right, uh, there has happened a lot of um, things when it comes to battery cars in Norway. Uh, so it has been increasing more and more. So actually last year, 50% of new car sales were uh, battery electric vehicles. So the population is about 50% uh, of the cars uh, that are on battery. But I, I still think that there's a big need for hydrogen when it comes to larger vehicles and trucks and other things. If you see the ambition in Europe, uh, European Green Deal, EU says that in by 2050, 90% of greenhouse gases from the uh, transport sector has to be gone. And several countries have set up some ambitious targets when they say that there should not be any more sales of uh, fossil fuel cars. There might not be allowed to refuse it, but uh, they, they can at least um, put policies in place where they can encourage people to buy something differently. Uh, that's allowed. And we think that, uh, seen from this study of, um, here, Hygiene Roadmap for Europe, uh, they said that the total number of vehicles in, um, in um, Europe uh, is quite high, and the targets for hydrogen is uh, 3.7 million uh, passenger vehicles and 500,000 trucks by 2030. Um, and I think if we look at what is planned for station and what is needed, there's a huge gap. Uh, so there definitely has to be done a lot of work. 
when it comes to building hydrogen station. And that's also what the, one of the tough jobs because you have to build them ahead of the traffic coming in. And that means that your business model is uh, relatively tough and to convince investors to build a lot of stations before the income is uh, there. That's also a big job. We think it's quite interesting to look at the total cost of ownership of different types of transport. And uh, if you look into these curves, you can see uh, many variations there. You see the blue lines are hydrogen. Uh, the green ones are for battery electric vehicles, while the orange ones are for internal combustion engines. You can see that hydrogen is, is lagging in the beginning is, uh, is way too high, and that's mainly due to lack of mass production. Battery cars has come further into the mass production uh, chain, while hydrogen still have a few years before they are down to the same level. And then you can see it catches up with the, with the battery cars and the fossil cars. And in some segments, uh, they are improving and doing much better. This is like the SUV. Uh, that's a popular car in uh, Norway. And also looking at the, the trucks, uh, for larger trucks, it's going to be um, a very interesting option to have hygiene. This is a very crowded slide, but I think it's kind of interesting to look into some examples. And this is... Uh, down to the left here, I compare uh, Audi e-tron 55 battery electric car with the Toyota Mirai, the latest version. And in Norway, it's a lot of discussion about energy efficiency on the electric car versus the hydrogen car. And they claim that it's so uh, extremely efficient, which it is. But uh, when it comes to the large SUVs, as I showed you earlier on the TCO, uh, the energy consumption is more or less the same with a new modern efficient uh, hydrogen car. It's about the same as uh, for a battery electric car like the Audi Tron. I think especially for you, if you are in a way creating uh, electricity out of uh, petrol, then it's uh, even a, a more difficult uh, case of convincing people that uh, the energy efficiency is better on the uh, battery electric cars. And of course, when you have the driving range of 650 kilometers and you're full in, in three to five minutes, is more or less like uh, the car you're using today. Um, another thing that can be used for introducing the cars faster is uh, if you look into the, the right here, uh, for taxis, for instance, very interesting uh, case for hydrogen. Because if you're running the taxi on the more than one shift, it's uh, definitely an advantage of running hydrogen. But you might say that uh, the, it's a little bit uh, more expensive. You see the fuel cost is about 37,000 NOC, just roughly divide by 10 and you get uh, dollars. So it's more costly. But at the same time, the politicians have said that the toll roads are for free for hydrogen cars. And that means that you will actually save uh, 40,000 per year and the economy of driving this car is very much better than you would do with a diesel car. So the taxi drivers now, they are just uh, urging us to build more stations so that they can uh, start changing into hydrogen cars. And then again, it's a, it's a push from uh, uh, the city government in Oslo, for instance. They say that they want 100% emission-free vehicles by 2030. And by 2024, all the taxis in Oslo has to be zero emission uh, vehicles. Looking into trucks, uh, they are not so much on the roads yet, but they will come from, I think, next year. There will be coming more and more trucks into the market. Still quite expensive, but uh, I believe in just a few years, the prices would come down to a level where it can be interesting to replace fossil uh, fuel trucks with, uh, with the hydrogen fuel. And here again, you can use, um, oh, sorry, uh, you can use the toll road as a mean to actually reduce the cost of uh, operating these trucks so that you can go down to a comparable level of costs. Hyundai has, for instance, uh, started to deliver trucks to Switzerland because they also have the same toll road system where the hydrogen trucks uh, can operate for free and the diesel trucks have to pay. So I think these countries like uh, Switzerland, Norway, 
and maybe others with the similar tax system, they can help out, uh, maybe take the first uh, hydrogen trucks and vehicles so that you can bring the cost down and uh, all other countries can benefit from that. We also in, uh, in Gothenburg uh, delivering hydrogen for, for the renovation company. They have tried batteries, but they say this is absolutely useless for us and our operations. So they, they really want to go for hydrogen on, uh, on their trucks. And then of course, how to get into this. Um, I compared uh, the charging infrastructure, infrastructure and the battery electric vehicles with the hydrogen refueling uh, infrastructure and the fuel cell vehicles. Uh, you said that the, the battery cars, they get a flying start because you can really start to refuel them everywhere. You have, everyone has a charging socket, at least if you have a house or a place where you can park your car and charge it. So that was quite easy to get going. You can charge uh, almost everywhere. But then of course you, you must uh, now comply with regulations that you need a special uh, charging uh, box and uh, that actually costing you a, a year worth of fuel. And then it comes to quick charges. Uh, many places they are putting up uh, these, quite okay somewhere, more costly other places. And if you want to go for the supercharging network, it's um, uh, where you can compete with the filling speed of uh, fossil fuel cars then it's, uh, it's a major cost and a major challenge. So if you fuel 200 kilometer driving range in 20 minutes, it's uh, probably what you get these days. But we see that the cost per delivered kilowatt hour is steadily increasing. If you charge at home, it's a very cheap uh, price, especially here in Norway. If you go to the petrol station and uh, do the quick charging, it's costing more or less the same as if you will uh, fill uh, uh, petrol. While for hydrogen infrastructure, it's the other way around. It's, um, it's quite expensive in the beginning. You have to maybe spend some uh, one or two million dollars to, to build a station. There are few cars, a very lousy business model. But when the traffic is increasing, you get more and more volumes through your station. And that means that you're getting close to a normal business model. And the more cars and trucks and buses that will come, um, it's, it's more easy to establish new stations and to expand the ones you have. So yes. it means that the, the, the cost per delivered kilowatt hour is steadily decreasing, is my statement. Yes. Uh, Anders talked a little bit about uh, governmental support. It's um, an important tool in the beginning, especially in the first phase for establishing hydrogen stations, where you actually need to fund the gap between uh, a normal business model and the uh, introduction uh, for these cars. So the better we can uh, collaborate between the private industry and the uh, governments, uh, the faster you can actually uh, set up the infrastructure and uh, get uh, a proper network in place. If we are just to go for, for these uh, fleets and uh, these opportunities where you can get closer to a business model fast, everything will take longer time. Uh, and uh, of course, time is not really what we have when it comes to the climate change. So if you want to move fast and uh, use hydrogen as a tool, then you really have to, to have some governmental support. So my conclusions are really that hydrogen is needed uh, to achieve the ambitious uh, cutting greenhouse gases the world need. Uh, we need support from uh, government. Proper instruments must be in place for support uh, the build-up of the initial infrastructure. And of course, the industry must plan and coordinate to reduce initial cost. Hydrogen will have the lowest TCO for long-haul transport and also for cars that travel long distances. For instance, taxis, uh, and I think that could be a very early market that could be interesting. And we, of course, are a dedicated hydrogen player in the fuel segment, and we want to expand our network in Scandinavia. Maybe to Hawaii another day. So thank you very much for your attention. Oh, very good. Thank, thanks, Ulf. And yeah, you can, you can come to Hawaii with your station anytime. We'd love thank to you. have you over here. <laughs> thank you. But, um, uh, we had to have one question on, on the chat side for you, and that was um, 
and it actually brought up a good point. That question was actually how much hydrogen production uh, is at the Oslo station. But, you know, you mentioned that most of your stations, if not all, are produced. The hydrogen is produced and then brought in. So could you talk a little bit to that? At the Oslo station, we do not have local production right now. We had it before, uh, but we will... Um, for the time being, we just truck in from uh, electrolyzer up at uh, Rukan, uh, in the middle of Norway, um, completely for salt free production. We also thinking that we want to convert this truck to hydrogen operation as soon as it's uh, available. But I think in in uh, most yeah. of us. I know. I don't. I don't. Everyone has that. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, <clears throat> somebody needs to go and mute. We've got a lot of background. Thank you. So, so I think, um, uh, especially in the first uh, period we are coming into right now, we need a lot of local production because there are many people now looking into large scale production, like Anders showed on his map. And that will come and that will bring the cost down. But for the time being, we, we will add local production in most of our stations. And could you give us an idea of how many vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, are in operation in Norway right now? Uh, we are just about 200. Um, it was on its way up, uh, but then we had this incident and we had the close up uh, high up, and then it was reduced. Um, Hyundai actually had uh, just launched a new model uh, of the uh, car, the Nexo, and they had um, uh, 100 orders already, and um, everything was cancelled in, uh, in just uh, a few months. But now we see that the market is picking up again. Uh, Toyota has started to sell the, the new Mirai. They are running a, a big commercial on the TV and uh, people are really interested to buy it. Uh, they will come into the taxi fleets and we think that they will, uh, the numbers will uh, double pretty fast. And the more stations we get, the more confidence we'll build in people and the faster the, the growth will be of our vehicles. Okay, agreed. I wanted to, I do want to spend a few seconds, Michael asked us to spend a few seconds talking about the incident at the one of your competitor stations that was being built. Um, and I'll just summarize it by saying there was a leak in a high pressure tank, then there was a fire, and then one of the tanks was compromised. And that caused no, no serious injuries and no fatalities, um, and not really too much damage, but it did definitely got the population's attention and like Alf said, it, it caused all the stations to shut down while they did their investigation. But the, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, basically the findings in the investigation were when they built the station, um, they actually had a, some defective uh, equipment in it and not assembled properly. So it really was a man-made problem. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a technology problem. It was a, uh, something where if you're not used to dealing with high pressure gases and, and the technology that you need for the, the actual um, materials that you use, the, the right um, gauge materials, the right metallurgy in the materials and the right um, techniques for assembling, you can, mm -hmm. you can cause problems. And most of the hydrogen experts that I'm aware of, uh, especially Ulf and, and Anders, they understand that and Paul and Mitch and, and all of us were, we're looking at hydrogen as a really safe um, answer to, to our transportation, particularly in grid needs as we decarbonize. But it also comes with uh, the requirement that you step up your game in terms of metallurgy and your engineering so that you produce safe stations. So do you want to comment, uh, yeah. Anders and Ulf? I can give some comments on that because it's... Um... I think it's uh, quite of an unfortunate uh, design there that they're using O-rings on high pressure. It's uh, probably allowed and approved by some uh, some uh, certifying agency, but uh, we don't like it and we don't use it. Uh, we have seen some filters with that type of uh, solution that is actually giving a leak, if possible. So we use uh, industry standard, uh, metal to metal, uh, well proven and tested over many, many years. And we have never seen such a problem like they have. Further, it's a uh, second thing that you need to know what's going on. And we have a lot of detectors. We come from the, the process industry, that's our background. 
and we like to see what is going on. So we have uh, hydrogen detectors where we have uh, these kind of uh, important uh, connectors, like into the high pressure tanks. And uh, we are quite sure that in, in, with our design, we would have seen that leakage uh, pretty fast, not after two and a half hour. Uh, and then our station would shut down into a safe mode. And this would never happen because of them it will be well known and vented and we wouldn't start a compressor that actually yeah, was one of the causes for, for this uh, incident. Thanks. Uh, Andres, do you, did you have any anything to add? Yeah, it, it was more a general comment, I think, and it's it's related to hydrogen and, and, and uh, the experience you have, because mentioned earlier, uh, hydrogen has been handled in large scale industrial use since early 1900s and even be, be before that, I think. So um, the, the new thing now is, is not sort of something uh, new uh, phenomenon with hydrogen. It, it's just that it's been elsewhere. So uh, there's huge uh, consumption or handling of hydrogen in industrial sites. Now it's being taken out of those more or less protected areas and being used elsewhere. And um, one thing is that people have to get used to it. And, but it also leads to some, some uh, revisions, adaptions or updates on, on procedures and might have to develop some new standards. Um, when I'm looking into this refine project and uh, the refinery at Shell, where they install now this electrolyzer, which will only, only contribute to 1% of the uh, total hydrogen amount at the refinery. So they're not concerned about hydrogen and safety in, in general, but it's more on how to uh, formalize and uh, and and make standards and regulations on on their own site for this new technology. Uh, so until now they've used reforming, of course, and natural gas, and now they're trying to switch over to electrolysis. Uh, first step is ten megawatt, and then they want to go to hundred in the next stage. So um, yeah, it's 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 natural now that hydrogen is being used in more fields that uh, we'll have to sort of make our way through it and find out how to best solve it. But always keep it safe, of course, safety first in these instances. Thanks. So the bottom line is don't just call your local plumber to hook up your hydrogen station. It is special equipment. It is a different industrial scale of uh, operating. And, you know, you do have to pay attention to that. You know, we have a couple of comments on the, on the chat side and one, I, I did notice that we had, um, look like Senator Wakai is on the, on the list there of uh, people participating. And we did have um, a question about where the legislature um, is, what's in their head in terms of adopting hydrogen, because we do have a hydrogen um, economy law on the books already. It's been on the books for, I think, since 2006. But um, Senator Wakai, if you're still out there, could you comment on the, what the legislature is looking at in terms of hydrogen for the future? Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Senator. There you go. I, I'm here. Sorry. I uh, start from my casual look this morning, but I just wanted to kind of listen in for the most part on uh, the discussion. Uh, this past legislative session, we passed three bills that kind of affect hydrogen. One was uh, a simple bill that fundamentally allows the state to charge for hydrogen. Right now, because of weights and measures requirements, we can't even allow for the sale of hydrogen. So that's a fundamental change that we made this year. Uh, the other two bills were one that uh, uh, changed the, the state's uh, fleet from uh, petroleum based to uh, zero emission based by 2035. Uh, and that will help us to, to move. If, if, if the state expects the public to embrace hydrogen, I think the state should be the leader. And so we've showing some leadership in that arena. Uh, the third bill that is helpful to hydrogen that we passed this year was um, uh, a, a GEMS bill, um, uh, Gwen Yamamoto allows on this call, but uh, it allows for federal funds to be used for the deployment of potential future hydrogen fueling stations. So uh, you saw that this year that uh, we passed three, I think, fundamentally significant bills that will help embrace hydrogen in the future. And 
really interested in learning to see how Norway and, and others have created the regime in which to embrace it even further, even from the regulatory side of things, as well as with the resource side of things. Thank you, Mr. Osterman. Oh, thank you, Senator. And we appreciate your support in the legislature and, and Gwen's support on the GEMS program as well. Um, but we can use everything we can, we can muster to help uh, to get us to our goals because really I think everybody wants to get there. And uh, like Paul says, Paul Pontio says, there's no silver bullet, it's silver buckshot. We've got we've to do batteries, we've got to do hydrogen, we've got to do uh, hydroelectric. We have to do everything we can uh, to start uh, weaning ourselves off of fossil fuel. So, but thanks for your support in the legislature. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'd like to turn, this is the start of the Q&A session. I'd like to start with, with Ida. Um, you know, as one of our panelists, you know, she actually, you know, growing up in Norway, um, kind of has a good feel for um, culture, the two cultures on the two different sides of the hemisphere here, we're 12 hours time difference apart, and how maybe, um, you know, some of the things that Oaf and Anders talked about, uh, you can relate. Like, for example, you know, in, in Anders' organization, he's not really like Department of Energy National Labs but he kind of is like Department of Energy National Labs. Could you kind of talk a little bit about um, some of the contrast that you, you can make between Hawaii and Norway? Yes, yes, I can for sure. Um, and thank you, Anders, Ulf, and, and Eugene for, for setting the stage today. Um, first and foremost, I think the, the major difference between, the, between Norway and Hawaii is... Um, the grid structure as one uh, for the for the energy energy industry that we have more um, we have a more distributed um, energy system uh, where in Hawaii we often have one player um, while in Norway you can shop basically shop for electricity um, which kind of sets the stage um, for our for our energy structure. When it comes to, to hydrogen and, and CENTEF, the organization that, that Anish works for, um, they're a very well-respected uh, organization and often sets the stage for our innovation projects. And um, our le legislator is, um, often works in partnership, often gets recommendations from them and um, they kind of drive our um, development pace and uh, is uh, the hub that Anders is working is, is, at is um, very respected and um, accredited across Europe. Thank, thanks, Ida. Um, I'd like to turn over to Paul and Mitch uh, for a couple of questions now, if you, if you had some come up while we're watching the presentation. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I'd like uh, our panelists to comment on uh, the political will in uh, Norway. Uh, how consistent is it, and how supportive is the polit uh, is the political uh, class to uh, hydrogen? Is it particularly the consistency? As maybe a new administration comes in, do they just cancel everything from the previous, or is there a good consistency going forward? Do you want to handle that, Anders? Uh, to find the unmute button first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, there might be different views, probably not uh, not uh, totally opposite, uh, Ulf and me, but as in he's from the industry side and I'm from the research side. Um, our, our research um, uh, council uh, are, have, are more or less to, to some extent, at least independent of uh, governmental prior priorities. Of course, there are some uh, some topics with high priority, which gets more, but there is sort of in the long run, there is at least some funds for most research and development. But um, our portfolio from uh, early, well, 2005, six, seven, is much higher in the European projects than in the Norwegian projects because 
there's much more funding and support outside of Norway. Um, I think you also see that when you looked into uh, Ulf's uh, slides, when uh, Equinor or Statoil, as they will call them, withdrew from uh, the hydrogen um, cooperation, that was also a time when uh, sort of all of this activity uh, got a setback in general in Norway. So it has been very, very slow since uh, at least 2010 and a bit earlier. Uh, and now it's the interest is gaining pace, but it, it's more like, I would say it's a political game more. They see the interest is, is huge everywhere. There is, it's now potential, but it, it's not driven by politics. So this, the hydrogen activities in Norway, they have been driven by industry interest. And I can also, uh, I, I would also say that uh, some of the research organizations in Norway, which have been uh frontiers here they have also pushed industry we have taken norwegian industry into european projects on hydrogen and in this way we have sort of kept norway pretty much uh in in the front line here and now we see that hydrogen is is sort of really accelerating all across europe and and the world and now the government is waking up tomorrow there will be this hydrogen roadmap being launched um, then let's see uh, what they really want to do there's lots of focus on hydrogen from natural gas of course saving our uh, oil and gas industries so we're a bit uh, curious on, on how much focus that will get this year thanks Anders. oh did you have anything to add I also see a lot of ups and downs, but it's uh, not uh, so much related to the governments. I think it's uh, also related to the car industry because they had their ups and downs. And of course, that's also with um, requirements from, from um, governments about emissions and so on. Uh, but we saw in the late 2000s that it was a, it's a big move and then it dropped and then it comes up again. And now we've seen that the, the battery cars, uh, I would say that for ten, 10 years ago, we wouldn't know which one was going to be the best in uh, 2020. It's a uh, battery and hydrogen are almost at the same uh, level, but then it, uh, the batteries was uh, developed faster and it was much easier to implement. So I think it's not only the governments, but also the, the car industry, but that's again, uh, due to requirements from uh, governments. And now we saw in Europe that uh, the latest regulations for CO2 emissions from the car fleet was tough uh, and would also require big fines if they didn't comply with it. That uh, changed a lot into battery cars and plug-in hybrids. And then comes the next uh, turn on the screw in 2025. And at that time, I don't think that the plug-in hybrids will be useful anymore and you need only batteries and hydrogen. So that's also from uh, the regulators. Thanks so. Uh, I'm going to go to Paul for the next question, but before we go to him, there's been some chat um, discussions, and I'd like to point out that the, there's a, a vessel called the Energy Observer here in Hawaii. It's a French uh, sailing catamaran that's completely powered by solar panels, wind, um, and it, it's not traditional wind sails, it's uh, wind foils or wind wings to generate um, thrust for the boat um, that's visiting Hawaii. And Hank Rogers pointed out, you know, that uh, if that boat was just full of batteries, it wouldn't be floating for very long. Even with the hydrogen system, it uh, increased the weight by, by um, about 300% uh, with all the hydrogen equipment and stuff on it. Because it's now a floating laboratory. It used to be a racing catamaran. It's a fast, fantastic uh, and fascinating piece of equipment. And, uh, it's now headed over to the Big Island, so I hope some folks over there get to look at it. But it's a, it brings up an interesting point when it comes to transportation. And one of my favorite sayings is when it comes to transportation, it's all about weight. And when it comes to energy storage, nobody can beat hydrogen in that category. That's why your heavy trucks always look at hydrogen before batteries, because when, when you do long haul, especially like in the continental U.S., you're talking about trucks that go a thousand miles or, or more on a single fill up of fuel. And if you have that much battery storage in your truck, you wouldn't be able to carry any cargo 
because your truck would exceed the weight the capabilities of the highway and the, 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 the government wouldn't let you drive your truck on the road or you wouldn't be carrying very much cargo. So um, could you, uh, Ulf and, and Anders, talk about the, the weight component um, for hydrogen, especially in the sense that you, you have been making ammonia for a long time and shipping it. And so there's obviously safety protocols for shipping hydrogen in a liquid form like ammonia. And maybe comment about, about the advantages to using ammonia for energy storage on the grid where you have to get the energy to a remote community. I know that in, in Norway, that one coal plant you were talking about um, uh, is going to be shut down. Hawaii has one coal burning power plant as well. It's going to be shut down next year. And it gets down to how are you going to replace that energy in a remote location? You want to start off, Ulf? Yeah, I can comment on that. It's, um, I think ammonia is mainly discussed for for ships uh, and for industrial use. Um, when we talked about the Norsk Hydroelectrolyzers and what is now Nell, uh, the electrolyzer company, they they started up in um, in a place called Rukan in Norway uh, back in 1927 uh, when they were uh, converting the process and uh, were to create a lot of hydrogen from. Uh, from the waterfalls, uh, and that was produ uh, made for ammonia production. So at that time, it was uh, huge plants, um, several stories high with electrolysis, and uh, running all day and night, uh, producing the ammonia. So I think it was something like 3,000 tons per day that were produced of hydrogen. So it means that uh, this large-scale production of uh, hydrogen from uh, renewables can be done, and it can be converted into ammonia. It has been done before, and if they could do it uh, eight years ago, we should be able to do it today. It's it's basically now about the cost of electricity, since uh, uh, today you can create uh, uh, the hydrogen from natural gas at a third of the price of what it's costing with uh, renewable power. So it means that something has to change in order for that to be an uh, economically interesting uh, option. Think so. How about Anders? Do you have any comment? Yeah, you, you, you touched upon this weight issue, batteries and, and hydrogen, and that is, um, I think, one one aspect which we find here now. It's uh, it's a very touchy uh, topic to try and compare batteries and and and, and hydrogen or, or fuel cells. So. Um, as Ulf mentioned, uh, the sales of, of battery electric cars here in Norway is extremely high. It's very, it's good. Uh, then again, for some reason, it's uh, turned into a with a very negative view on hydrogen cars, um, and that's been focused on on much uh, or lately at least when they have found an argument that the um, efficiency, so you'll have high losses from producing hydrogen um, by uh, 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 electrolyzers and compared to using the electricity directly in batteries. Um, that is of course true, but then also looking into efficiency and weight, there's so many factors uh, which are relevant for uh, any kind of transportation device or use of this. So uh, you have to look into uh, the requirements and needs for these applications to find out what's the best uh, combination or, or technology for that use. We look into, for instance, ships. So we have these uh, near coast ferries where now lots of them are operating on batteries, which works perfect. And then we also have these longer routes out to islands where, as you say, batteries would make the boat sink. So there has to be an, 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 a good analysis of each application. Boats is a bit more simple because then you tailor made them often for a route. Cars you don't tailor make for every person who, who, who wants it. Although with batteries and fuel cells, you, you actually can adopt a bit more than with conventional cars. So uh, at least for, for when it comes to trucks and buses, you could say in the future you, uh, you um, you define, you specify uh, a bit more details when you buy your vehicle 
uh, that could be possible in the future where you just have standardized modules. Um, but at least my my main point is that uh, there's it, it's um, there are uses where hydrogen has huge benefits to batteries, and we just need to make sure we don't sort of um, confront this or present this as a as a battle between the two of them. And they the two technologies they cooperate or are being combined to together solve the uh, CO2 emission problems we have now. Um, one issue, one thing I thought about, you mentioned ammonia, and I agree with Ulf that that's going to be probably more industrial use, so um, <clears throat> you won't see much ammonia in, in, uh, in um, public applications or use. Um, I'm, I'm not the expert in safety, but we have some projects with safety experts, and looking at safety distances, uh, comparing hydrogen and, and ammonia, you see the, the uh, poisonous or toxic uh, issue with ammonia is much, much more of a problem than uh, issues with hydrogen and, and explosions, for instance. So a, a safety zone for ammonia would be several times larger than for hydrogen. So that could be done in industrial uses, but when it comes to public use, uh, that's going to be more difficult for larger amounts of ammonia. Thanks, Andres. Um, that the name of that boat was the Energy Observer. For those of you that didn't, I think energyobserver.com is the, the website. If you want to go look at it. Um, and Michael chimed in and said, you know, one of the biggest polluters we have, um, it's not really in Hawaii but it's going to and from Hawaii and that's cargo ships. So we're, we're really looking forward to the jet fuel conversion, you know, when they can come off of uh, fossil fuels for aviation and for large ships, but that may be a whole nother show by itself. Sorry, my rooster's going off again. So that's a good cue for Paul to take over and ask a question. Yeah. So, you know, one of the big issues with hydrogen, of course, is the cost. And we've been talking about, a lot about that today. But my question revolves around safety, but safety as far as public perception goes. Is there, we're, we're always surprised at how little information people have. We give lots of tours and do a lot of public education at Blue Planet Research. <clears throat> and we're always surprised at how many people don't even have a clue that there is such a thing as a hydrogen fuel cell electric EV. It's not even on their radar. But on the safety side, my question really is, is there anything going on in Norway or Europe where the industry stakeholders are actually doing any kind of public education campaign around the safety of hydrogen? Because this is one of the biggest obstacles we face is just getting the general public to feel comfortable about the safety. Everyone in the industry knows how safe hydrogen is, but the general public typically remembers the Hindenburg or even things like hydrogen bomb, which have no reference at all. So if they could, if any of the panelists could speak to what's going on as far as education and safety, um, we'd like to know so that we can maybe duplicate some of that in Hawaii. I might comment on that. Um... I don't think there is any public information, uh, basically, but there's a lot of uh, research projects and uh, networks created on safety, uh, that is uh, uh, learning and uh, transferring learning. And when it comes to information from governments or local authorities, uh, I don't think that exists. It's more like uh, us being involved in hydrogen that currently are informing. Uh, for instance, we have on our website a topic about safety. So if people are having some questions about that, they can click in and, uh, and uh, see a little bit. I also took that in, in this uh, small movie I mentioned that we we just have to handle uh, hydrogen in the right way, then it's a safe fuel. But until people understand what this is all about and uh, how, it, how it's uh, affecting them, then uh, they will be a little bit scared because they uh, wrongfully, they have this Hindenburg uh, explosion on their mind, which is uh, far away from what we are talking about. 
But um, again, it's, uh, it's learning by doing that we have to move forward and show them that this is a safe fuel. Let me just add to that. What, what is the general public perception of, of the hydrogen cars, hydrogen fuel cell cars? Is it easily accepted? Yes, I think they are very much accepted. So, but for us, of course, it was um, a blow with this uh, explosion at uh, the station uh, in Norway two years ago. Uh, that of course changed the perception of uh, many people, but in the end, it it was a big bang and uh, no damage, uh, just uh, a few airbags on cars that were blown out, and uh, that's the, <laughs> the only thing that really affected people. So I'm I'm also telling people that even with this uh, big bang and uh, large uh, sound and uh, shock wave, that was felt by a lot of people. There was no damage to people. There was absolutely no damage at all. Yeah. And I had an interesting talk with the, the fire chief uh, the day after uh, this explosion. And he said that I'm much more worried about the propane. Uh, this is a gas I don't like very much because it, if it uh, leaks out and it floats away and I really don't know, know where it is, hydrogen, I know where it goes. Straight up and uh, I can mm, handle my rescue and... Uh, and safety missions based on that. It's easier, he said. But we just have to make sure that uh, Arjen is not released and, uh, unless it's in a controlled way. And this type of uh, incidents, we, we just have to do the best we can in order to prevent them. That will create confidence in people. Thanks, so. Mitch, did you have any other questions? Oh. Paul? Yeah, no, just a short one on, on the public perception because um, there hasn't been much research into that uh, as far as I know in Norway or in Europe but uh, it's being established now and uh, also within one of the projects we have here in Norway on a safety project there's a PhD looking into public perception and it's done a survey um, should come out some results this year on the publication uh, which is also uh, the yeah sort of expanding on and looking into cooperation with others. I think also the Norwegian Hydrogen Forum had a sort of informal uh, questionnaire as well. The, the main thing is that you have to make sure you don't uh, ask or check with those people who are familiar with hydrogen technology. So those driving cars, they they uh, they are of course uh, comfortable with it, and I think that's in general. So. When you see technology uh, being used, uh, you, you, after a while, you, 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 you see there's nothing, no harm in it. It works well, and that's going to be more efficient than trying to educate people uh, before they see or experience the technology. So, uh, at least from my point of view, it's, I think it's going to be difficult to sort of educate um, population. Uh, before you have the technology in place. Okay. Mitch, did you have any other questions? Uh, yeah, I do. I want to. Uh, I want to uh, loop back to uh, policy and uh, rules and regulations. If our, if our uh, guests could comment on, is there like a central authority in Norway? or an, an organization that makes sure all these policies are coordinated for the implementation of a hydrogen economy in Norway? In other words, is there some kind of a centralized coordinator or control so that you know we have the big picture and we're managing it rather than just piecemealing it? I might start, I don't think there's a central um... Uh, institution controlling it and uh, and coordinating it. Uh, we have asked for it for a long, long time, and uh, uh, but I think hydrogen uh, still um, for these years has been too small, really. That it's um, uh, it's not such a big issue. That might change now because we have this uh, new government with this willingness to look into the future for the new energy forms. And uh, Anders also stated earlier that they will uh, tomorrow present the roadmap for hydrogen, which means that they have actually been sitting down and studied how they should uh, go together. 
how Norway could take advantage of the hydrogen development and uh, what type of policies should be in place for moving forward. So we're of course very excited to see what comes out tomorrow, but uh, so far it hasn't been really a coordinated thing. I, you know, Ulf, I noticed that when you had your video, you were refueling your, your um, Hyundai and yeah. um, your station uses uh, pretty much a standard nozzle to fuel your vehicle. Is, is that the like J2601 standard like they use in California? That's the beauty of hydrogen, you know, it's standardized worldwide. So whether if you fill in Hawaii or in Norway or in Japan, it's the same standard. Both on the nozzle, on the receptacle, and also the the standard and the protocols for refueling. So and, that's the and who who took the lead on that standardization? I mean, is is it just a bunch of folks got together and agreed in some forum, or is there a specific uh, organization? No, it was a large working group uh, with the car industry and some uh, technical companies like uh, gas companies, uh, especially. Uh, in the 2000, uh, up to 2006, 7, I believe. There was a lot of, of, of activity. Uh, first, we had the 350 bar standard, and then came the 700 bar standard. Uh, and there's still activity in, um, in this organization. Um, basically, it's the car industry that is uh, behind it, because they want, uh, want uh, this to be quite similar to what people are used to when it comes to fueling fossil cars. That, that makes sense. In yeah. fact, uh, going back to the Energy Observer, one of the things they have their hydrogen fuel cell in that, in that vessel is a Toyota Mirai fuel cell that's been repackaged yeah. and modularized and put into the vessel. And it's an amazing piece of work because uh, the, the Mirai has a 114 kilowatt fuel cell in it. Um, the big trucks that we, we used to make for the Air Force only had a 30 kilowatt fuel cell in them. So that it's, it's pretty impressive how much uh, energy you can pack into a small fuel cell. But it, it makes sense that the, uh, the motor vehicle companies kind of kind of have the center stage on standardizing. So uh, I guess we just have to stay tuned with them. Maybe Mitch, even on the safety side, maybe that's a, a good way to, to kind of keep in touch. So back to you, Mitch. Hey, I have another question. Um, one of the things we're doing here in Hawaii is focusing on public transportation and looking at converting our, our uh, bus fleets over to hydrogen, mainly because A, they, uh, are, they're a great technology, they're quiet, they don't uh, kick out uh, exhaust emissions. And particularly for the uh, tourism industry and buses, you, you can run your bus when it's stopped as rather than uh, and, and uh, run your air conditioning when your bus is stopped, as opposed to a diesel bus shuts down and then the, the, um, uh, the temperature of the bus goes up until you can start going again. So I want to ask the question, what's been the take up for, from your public transportation um, organizations um, for using hydrogen buses? I might answer. It's, um, it's been quite low when it comes to, to hydrogen buses. There has been some um, uh, trial projects, demonstration projects that has been uh, going on, uh, also here in Oslo, where I stay. Uh, the last five buses were uh, just stopped running uh, this uh, new year. And Oslo, the city of Oslo has uh, actually locked into electric buses. So they're running a large fleet of electric buses for the, for the short routes. Uh, and that's um, what, where they have the focus right now. In other parts, they also have uh, biogas uh, buses and uh, some natural gas buses some places. But I think hydrogen has been um, a little bit uh, back when it comes to, to bus operations. Hey, Alf, I had a question on that electric buses then. You know, I've, I've been to Europe and several cities have electric transportation that runs off the grid, uh, either by, by rail uh, electric conductivity or overhead wires. Um, mm -hmm. And then when it gets out into the rural areas, it goes to batteries. It switches off and, and goes to batteries. Um, it, does that seem to be something that the, the um, municipalities, the cities, uh, 
like is to be able to switch between grid power and battery? Um, or is that being used at all? If they have the grid power system, then it's uh, quite okay to change the buses into some battery use as well, because uh, just to install this uh, overhead wires, it's extremely costly. And uh, of course, it's uh, not so many people who do it, uh, but some places, a few places it's done. But um, if you start to do the calculations, it's uh, much cheaper to buy hydrogen buses. And also one reason for hydrogen buses not being um, there is that they have been too expensive so far. So it's a lot of public uh, tendering when it comes to, to bus operations. And uh, then, of course, you, it's difficult to, to have this high level cost of the hydrogen buses coming in. Okay. Paul, did you have any? Oh. Yeah, I'm just thinking because um, I, I also don't know here the details, just a bit comparing to the sh boat um, activities going on in Norway. And that is um, one issue, as uh, earlier stated, is the initial high cost of establishing hydrogen infrastructure compared to easier adding a, uh, a battery charger. And um, especially for the ferries, uh, it, it's been they have been given extra funding, extra support to establish these chargers for ferries. You know, also here where you have ferries along the coast, the grid is too weak because they're not built for charging ferries. So the strongest grid is of course in the land and out on the coast it's weaker. So some places they have to put just as much battery packs on the quay as on the ship. Um, and that, system together with the chargers, those have received quite a lot of funding, which to some extent has been taken out of these tender operations. So the actual fuel costs are even lower than only sort of the electricity versus hydrogen, because there's also some extra funding, let's say, for infrastructure for battery um, applications. And that's something which it, it can be understandable in one way, but then again, it's not technology neutral and it doesn't give you, or it probably won't give you the optimized combination of things. So for that, that single case, it might be the best choice, but if you look to other synergies around you, 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 you shouldn't lock into one technology. So in this case, lots of batteries on, on the ferries. And if you look into the overall picture with different transportation modes, other boats, you could see a different um, combination of, of, uh, of uh, fuels or, or, or technologies being, uh, being used. Yeah, and like, and like Paul mentioned, you know, it's not just the charger. In Ulf's presentation, he talked about, you can plug in your car at home, let it charge all night. But if you want it to charge in three hours, you need to have a, a increased power at your house. And if you want it to charge in 10 minutes, you need voltages and, and capability, not just in the charger, but the actual delivery, service delivery to your house, which people just, they, they don't think about. I mean, if a, if a business wanted to install 15 or 20 chargers in their parking lot for their employees to charge, they may end up paying $200,000, $300,000 to upgrade the utility delivery to their parking lot before they even buy the chargers. So when we talk about infrastructure for um, charging infrastructure, it's not just the cost of the chargers, it's the upgrade of the utility delivery service to your location as well. So uh, Ida, you haven't been included in the Q&A part so far, I feel kind of guilty. Did you have any questions? Um, now, kind of a clarification. I wanted to ask um, Ulf um, about, you remember you mentioned the tax incentives, and I think that has a huge um, impact on, on the early adoption of especially yeah. electric vehicles in Norway. So yeah. for the, the wider audience, can you elaborate on that? Yes, I can do that, uh, but you're absolutely right. It's very important. Uh, the, the benefits that the government has been willing to give the, the battery electric vehicles. Uh, first, it came to the electric vehicles, other than the hydrogen cars came, we, we got the same benefits. 
we even have a special uh, license plate with EL as the <laughs> starting uh, number for the electric cars and then HY for hydrogen. It's quite interesting. But um, basically it was given up to 50,000 cars or for the battery electric vehicles up to 2017. And that was, they will have uh, free parking in municipal, municipal parking. Uh, they do not have to pay any VAT on a car, which is 25%. It's a huge sum for private uh, citizens. Um, there's no import duties, which might be very, very high in Norway. We have among the highest import duties in the world, and especially for Tesla, for instance, you can save, uh, you can save um, a few hundred thousand knock, which is if you divide by 10, so maybe you can save $50,000 on a car, which is uh, makes the Tesla very popular in Norway. Um, another benefit you have is that you can actually drive in the public uh, uh, or these bus lanes in the morning rush. So if you come from the west side of the city of Oslo, for instance, you can save one hour because you can use the, the bus lane. And that was also a very popular incentive. Now they had to reduce that uh, because there are too many electrical cars. So they, they said that, okay, you have to be at least one passenger if you want to go there in the rush hour, then, uh, then you do so. But for the hydrogen cars, we have the same benefits and they will be in place up to 2025 or 50,000 vehicles. While for these electric vehicles, they have extended these um, incentives um, further and further, so it's still alive but they are being reduced somewhat. Um, you have to pay parking somewhere. You have to pay a small amount in the, in the toll roads. That's also one thing to mention that the toll roads are for free for these uh, vehicle types. And uh, they're also discussing whether there should be VAT for uh, a sum that is exceeding uh, $60,000. Then, then you have to pay VAT for the amount above that. That means the Teslas and the Audis and so on will have to have a slightly high price. So uh, you are absolutely right, Eva. These have been very, very valuable. And uh, that is also shown by, uh, I think that um, it's mainly private persons who buy these cars because it's a, it's a huge benefit for you. If you can save 25, maybe 50% of the cost of the car, that's extremely good. And if you at the same time have a free fuel and you can drive quickly into the work in the morning, of course, people will buy these cars. And uh, by the way, they are nice cars, <laughs> very good cars. So, so that's fun. So there are not many places who have these type of incentives. Uh, and that's uh, why I think also the, the growth in the car population has been so fast in Norway. All right, thanks, Philip. Well, we're wrapping into the, the last uh, 10 minutes of our time slot here. And I'd like to actually ask Michael uh, Markrich if he has any questions. He's not an official panel member, but um, it's his program. So <laughs> I think I'll turn it over to well, Michael for you. Mm. Well, I, I want to uh, thank you all for coming all this way. Um, yeah, I was wondering when you look into the future in Norway, um, how many people do you see employed in the hydrogen economy? I think that would be quite a lot. <laughs> Don't you agree, Anders? It's um, yeah, yeah. Just, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm I'm not in the business to say how many. I know there's been a report from from colleagues at Sintef uh, who said sort of eighty thousand, and then of course. What does that entail? Is it uh, everything from from, uh, from cradle to grey, or it depends on how you look at it? And I think that was seen as a bit optimistic, and of course, much linked to the offshore industry or oil and gas industry. So, um, but we see now more and more uh, activity here. Uh, companies growing large. Um, large industry actors getting involved now just recently uh one of the major engineering um industries in norway okay they bought prototech which is uh, not only focusing on hydrogen and, and fuel cells but they're um, developing relevant technology and been working in this field for many many years um 
you see um, other companies cooperating with international suppliers, uh, establishing um, uh, manufacturing sites in Norway. So there's lots going on. And I think that's the, what's always difficult to have the governments trying to adjust their incentives or policies or support when is the correct timing for this. We know that in the rest of Europe, there's lots of activities, they're scaling up, they're getting into production, there's billions of euros being put into companies like this. And what do we do in Norway? So of course, we are a much smaller country. So it's difficult to compete, but at least we should do our best to compete in areas where we already are good. And that's the thing which I feel has been lacking. So hasn't been a good push in any direction. So I'm very much looking forward till uh, till tomorrow and or a bit scared that they don't dare to sort of, they call it a roadmap, but uh, my worst fear is that it, it's not the real, or it might be a map, but they don't show where to go. And that's what we need, I think. We have to do the job ourselves, Thomas. That's the way it is. So we just have to see what they come up with. And then of course we have to, to make the moves and say that, okay, Nice, uh, nice roadmap. Then we get going. So that's the way it is. I, I agree with you. I think most important for us now is to have seen that industry in Norway is um, is awake and uh, they want to invest. And I think there's large synergies. Uh, for hydrogen, you need scale, and uh, that means all kinds of equipment and users and. and manufacturing so uh, there's a momentum now which which sort of rolls and that will uh, be pretty much independent or anyway run um, no matter how this roadmap looks like mm -hmm. well i think there has been a tremendous change in the perception of people and uh, businesses and governments you see more and more businesses and larger uh, companies are coming into this and uh, going big time, uh, these are the big plans so far, but I think that it will be also uh, realized uh, quite a few of them. I think as uh, was mentioned earlier by Anders, the marine sector in the, in the maritime uh, shipbuilding and so on is really interested to get going on this one. So there will be some areas where I think we can do quite well in Norway. And if we can make a smart way to convert our natural gas resources into hydrogen, then uh, I think that we will have a very big export of hydrogen as well. Great. I think Paul had another question. Yeah, I have a, a technology question. Um, we all know the, the two basic electrolysis technologies are either alkaline or PEM. What is the, the split or ratio you think in the, the industry there in those two technologies for producing your hydrogen? Alkaline versus PEM. Almost this is your table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's difficult because it's not yet really a market, of course, to, to some extent. Um, but what I see, uh, it, it, if you're to choose based on economics right here and now for a certain size, then much would go on alkaline because of the lower investment costs and a bit higher efficiency, perhaps, but uh, I think also, uh, as, as Ulf says, if you if you want to produce locally in smaller amounts, uh, alkaline is going to be very expensive, and you'll be more flexible with a PEM system. So uh, it, it's very depending again on on where you are, what you want to do, and the boundaries. So if you have, for instance, we're setting up a um, project now. <laughs> in uh, the World Heritage Fjord, Girange, and uh, that's planned with, um, with uh, hydropower, uh, small hydropower plants, which uh, where the production is, is varying over the years. So uh, and that site looks like it doesn't match well with alkaline and would be better with PEM technology, despite its its, its uh, higher cost, also the 10 megawatt system at Shell Refinery is is PEM. Um, then again, some of these uh, projects are 
are a result of sort of uh, not friendship but formal cooperation on perhaps also history wise so it doesn't have to 100% make economic sense right there and then but there is a sort of collaboration in one direction so for the future they see we need to go for PAM or if the sort of next step would be offshore connected to wind then you might want to go to, to PAM anyway so uh, yeah. Difficult question, or difficult to, to give an exact answer. <laughs> I, I think uh, one thing is that uh, your your cost of hydrogen will be close to the cost of electricity. Uh, it moves down, and um, capex and all other things will not matter so much anymore when it comes to large scale production. So it means that if you if you are aiming for large scale production, then you must have low electricity price, of course. And that means that if you have a very efficient electrolyzer, you lose less electricity, and that gives you a benefit. So if that comes from outline electrolyzer, that is uh, more efficient. Or if maybe you can use uh, a high pressure PEM, that will give you some advantage in, in that area. So you just have to make the calculations and see what is right for your application. Well, thanks. Thanks, I appreciate it. I know that Nell has been kind of on the alkaline side for the most part, and they bought Proton, which is, uh, I mean, pl uh, Proton on site, which is all PEM. So now has it covered both ways, no matter what. Anyway, I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. We've we've lasted through two whole hours, and and I don't see a whole lot of people migrating away. So it must have been a decent discussion. I'd like to thank um, Ulf and Anders and uh, Eugene for for giving us some great presentations. Uh, Ida and Paul and Mitch uh, and, and folks on the, on the side for sending in chat questions. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Markrich to, to wrap us up here, it's his, his show. So uh, back to you, Michael. And you're on mute, by the way. So there thank you, you all. Um, here in Hawaii, you know, it's, it's great that we're able to expand our a conversation to people around the world who are actually at the very cutting edge of these new technologies. And so thank you very, very much for uh, taking your time this evening, this evening there in Norway, to speak with us. And uh, so thank you. And I, I hope sometime I get a chance to visit Norway and I hope sometime you get a chance to visit Hawaii. So thank you. Yes, sleep tight. It's already 11 at night over there. It's almost, almost midnight. So midnight. thanks again. <laughs> This is outside now, so it's not really dark. I'm not sure what you see. <laughs> this is it's been out there light, but, you know. Yeah. That's, that's what you so. get for being near the Arctic Circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. it's so. payback time in the winter, so you know it's uh, dark <laughs> at three o'clock. <laughs> All right. Thanks again to everyone for participating, and we really appreciate.